from the vault, high atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hello, hello, and thank you for tuning in to Talking Catholic. This is Mary McCusker, and I am joined today by Mike Walsh. We are recording this on August 20th. It is the end of August, and I was at the store last night, and I saw Halloween decorations, Mike. <laughs> what happened to this year? Like, where I don't where know. did it go? What's going know. on? I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know, and it's driving me insane. Uh, of course, I, c- congrats for being in a store. Uh, yes. You know, I, I actually, Groceries. <laughs> well, okay. At the I, grocery store. There are decorations for fall and Halloween. I'm waiting to see Christmas. Like, oh, it'll come soon enough. Don't you worry. <laughs> the um, uh, No, it's it, we are in that time of year where it's the end of... Actually, the end of August always kind of depresses me, but it reminds yeah. me of when I was in high school and football camp was coming around the corner and the depression that would hit with going away to football camp for a week where I knew I was going to be run into the dirt and uh, all sorts of just oh. your body is put through <laughs> such terrors and being around all the guys. I forget that you were a football player. I was, yes. I, I can't this, picture my that. My current 245 pounds can be directly related to uh, my life as you a You just said your school. weight on a podcast? Oh, what do I God, say? men can just throw that number around like it's I am nothing. 6'2", 245, and 48 What's years old. What's your blood type? O positive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't now we know secure. way too much about Mike Walsh. <laughs> the, um, but you know, it's so funny. I'm, I'm actually very excited today because we're talking about a podcast. Uh, Really? I really am. I'm very excited. We Usually are talk- I'm the peppy one and you're just... Yeah, I'm, I lack pep most of the time. <laughs> you're, why are you excited? I am excited because we're in... We This is, for me, this time period is one, is one of my most joyous because I am a political junkie. Mm-hmm. So by the time this is posting, um, we will have just been through the Democratic National Convention mm-hmm. and we're leading up into the Republican National Convention. And this is like... Super Bowl, the Tony Awards, um, the Oscars. But those are actually joyful. I don't know if that's the right word for this current season. It's more dread and anxiety (laughs) and, you know, what's going to happen. Well, you know, here's the thing is that I, uh, I, I got into politics as a I'm using air quotes right now as a fan, uh, but as an interested person back in the early 80s, like I remember the 1980 election, uh, which was, I think, t- almost 20 years before you were born, Mary. Um, the, uh, but I remember, and that was the election between uh, President Carter and soon to be President Reagan. Um, and my mother had just met President Carter on a tour oh. of Gloucester City, as a matter of no fact. Way. Yeah, and uh, so he was. He was part of a you know uh, you know the usual pre-election tour that he yeah. was on. He was in Gloucester City. My mom had to make the decision whether or not to shake his hand or take his picture. <gasps> and for me, oh, I wouldn't she, know what to do. She made the decision to take the picture, so she could show me the picture. Uh. And I remember thinking, oh, I don't know. I think I would have shaken, shook his hand because I. And yeah. that had nothing to do with party affiliation. Just. Right. Mm, cool to see the president. Right. So in the mid 80s, I forget what year exactly. I want to say 83, 84, President Reagan came to Glassboro, New Jersey, which was one town oh over gosh. from where I grew up in yeah. Clayton. And uh, he vi- I think he was visiting as part of the commencement exercises for Glassboro High School. So I watched the, the, the you know, Marine One come in and wow. land and he walked mm-hmm. off. And, and, and so and he, that kind of formed my political appreciation and because of that, I have been a political junkie ever since. I've never missed a State of the Union. Mm. I've never missed a presidential address. You know, press conferences and stuff like that, you'll miss all that. But like right. a major right. event that the, the president speaks, I never missed any of that stuff. And I find it fascinating. And I really, I always kind of thought my career arc would end up kind of similar to what it ended up as. But I, my goal as a young person was to become a chief of staff for some political mm. person, governor, Senator, president, something like that. I think I, I still have a chance. I see you doing that. It's not too late, Mike. No, it's not. It's not. And then when, when the TV show The West Wing came out, mm-hmm. which I, I still think is prob- probably did the best job of showcasing what government life was like from a you know dramatic perspective, mm-hmm. but um, all the ins and outs. Um, like I was really invested in that show, and I thought it was outstanding. And and it really, aside from being very well written, it gave you a good insight. And now, as an old man, I follow oh. 245 pounds. I follow all of these political blogs. Like I go out of my way. I'm like, can I find a, a conservative leaning one? Can I find a progressive leaning one? I want to. I'm going to get both sides of the same argument. Right. Right. 
That's they, a rare thing, Mike. And and this kind of leads into the discussion we're going to have. Is, um, I make a point not to watch pundits. So mm-hmm. I try to find raw new, news and then I discern mm-hmm. using my experiences in life and determine like where I fall into whatever we're discussing, right. whatever topic we're discussing. It's not always so simple. It is. It involves, you know, a lot of brain power, homework, research. It's, it's a lot of, you know. That takes energy and time. And it a does. A lot of people aren't really willing to do it, including myself. You know, it's easier to just have a black and white perspective about mm-hmm. things, pick a quote side, yeah, and stick to it and yeah. attach your identity to it. But I have a lot of respect for people who take the time to tease through the the gray area. Mm. Yeah, where where most people think of. Twitter is this horrible universe. For political junkies like me, it's fantastic because you actually do hear so many different perspectives. Right. The key is finding ones that are intelligent and well articulated. Mm-hmm. That is oftentimes difficult and, to find and on Twitter. And done in 240 characters. <laughs> <Yes>. also, <laughs> we live in a world where our attention spans are no more yeah. than that. But I, I look for, I specifically look for people who talk about. Who, who will link to articles that right, show a perspective, right. and particularly from ones from, from magazines and stuff that I don't necessarily follow as part of my regular course mm-hmm. of acts. Like, I'm not a New York Post, Wall Street Journal, New York Times kind of guy, Washington Post kind of guy. Like, I'll try to find more esoteric magazine articles, long form articles, mm-hmm. things like that, other podcasts, things like that. So, anyway, right. so I, I, I say all that to welcome our guest, who I'm actually working on a couple of. Political, uh, not political, that's not really the best way of putting it, but but politically focused projects with him. So we have Matt Davis with us today, who is the director of the Office of Life and Justice for the Diocese of Camden. Welcome, Matt. How are you? Thanks, Mike. And let me start by saying you could be the chief of staff for my office if that would fulfill a vocational need for you. Problem solved. Well, All right. I can't figure out how to. Uh, Matt and I have had to work a lot together this summer, and I'm kind of shocked he came on the podcast because I've spent a lot of my time speaking very directly to people lately. And I'm actually surprised anyone wants to work with me right now. Um, but, uh, but Matt's been a good sport about everything. Actually, Matt's going to come back in a couple of months to talk about another project that we've spent a lot of the summer working on, but we're not really Ooh, ready to announce wait. it yet. But we want to talk about a couple of national politically focused projects that have come out through the USCCB, um, p- specifically a program called Civilize It. Mm-hmm. You want to tell us what that's about, Matt? Sure. I love just the title on one of their, their pages. Uh, they have a pledge for civility. It says, a divided country fights at the dinner table, mm-hmm. political vitriol. What does it mean to love our neighbors in the midst of such a climate? I was telling you earlier that I had a conversation with a friend recently. It was just by text, you know, a great way to have a deep and thoughtful conversation. (laughs) And he shared with me something I didn't agree with, kind of about morals and politics. And I quickly wrote him back, telling him how he was wrong. (laughs) And then he quickly wrote me back and sent me like a link to an article. Uh, which I start, I mean, a link to a YouTube video. I started to watch. I was like, this is ridiculous. You know, Mm -hmm. I clicked and responded back. And they went back and forth for probably 10, 15 minutes. Nothing was accomplished. I didn't listen to one thing he said. You know, I was telling him he was wrong before he finished writing. And, you know, it's it's a good friend of mine from growing up in Millville. So now I'm left with, you know, I really don't want to talk to him right now. He doesn't want to talk to me. And the question is, is could there be a better way we have done it? And I think Civilize It is trying to say, how can we have these needed conversations about morality and politics and faith, but do it in a way where we can keep our relationship, keep our unity. You know, um, I I grew up in a house, a divided household. So my father came from a a longtime Democratic family. My mother came from a longtime Republican family. But you'd never know it because they never talked about it. They so really, oh yeah, they they would not talk politics with each other. Well, they're yeah, I know. (laughs) Your parents are. I'm not going to get into it about my dinner table conversations, but (laughs) the um, so they they both talked about you know their or no, they didn't talk about their their political views. They didn't. And their feelings were, they knew that their votes would always cancel out. Um, so <laughs> oh, they figured yeah. it wasn't, wasn't worth having each a fight about votes. it. So <laughs> it, was, it was perfectly fine. And for anyone listening to the podcast today who's hoping that we're going to give you some perspective on who you should vote for or what our, what our own personal perspectives are on the, on the issues of the day, not going to happen. That is not really what this podcast is about. There are so many people in the world that are more than happy to tell you what to do. Um, We just want to talk to you about how to do it and how to do it in a way where you can help yourself 
by learning, and you can help others by teaching them, you know, that we don't have to, like Matt resorted to earlier this week, angrily, <laughs> you know, telling other people that they're wrong, even though, you know, in your heart of hearts, you may feel that they are, in fact, wrong. Um, if I can give you a little bit of insight in my own perspective. So by my nature, by my job title, I, I'm, the, I'm a public relations guy. Mm-hmm. I am very much a propagandist, right? <laughs> so Fair. I am, it, it's, it's what I do. I, right. I, I promote the Catholic Church in a full-throated way, um, most of the time in things I believe in, and sometimes with things I may not hold the exact same views about, mm-hmm. depending on what the view is, and I, I admit that. Um, I'm a human being. A good sinner as I am. Um, <laughs> but what I have learned in 20 years of doing public relations is what Matt did with his friend never works. Mm-hmm. Now, it just doesn't. People, when, it, when a person has a strongly held belief, um, it is next to impossible to impact that belief in just one text, mm-hmm. one tweet, one right. conversation. It takes a long time of accompanying a person, mm-hmm. really really talking to them and, and understanding why they feel the way they do and why you, know, you might have a perspective that they're all able to walk down a path and find themselves understanding the same thing you do. Right. I know that sounds like a, a kind of a frou-frou way of, of explaining a situation, but it really is, I mean, scientifically, using brain scans, that is the way we work. So right. we, I talked earlier about the DNC and the RNC. The DNC and the RNC are giant propagandist platforms for yep. four days apiece. They're not really intended for the rank-and-file commoner voter, civilian. They're intended to gin up their base, really get them excited about whoever the, their candidates it's going to be. And that's fine. And you, we, we should, as normal voters, watch them, but we should watch them with a grain of salt, reason, re, realizing that it may not, if I'm, if I'm a moderate, um, it, may, it may not be targeted for me. And if I'm a Republican watching the DNC, I know that I'm probably not going to be impacted by that. Right. But it's good to know what the other people are saying, and it's good to understand that that there is an underlying message and that you may not be the audience in right. mind. So, there, I mean, I, there are literally college courses that go on for yeah. years that, that talk about this stuff, and I've taken most of them because in addition to being 245 pounds, I also have a master's degree God, in public relations. I believe <laughs> that you just keep throwing that around. That's a good point, though. I mean, yeah. a, a question that... <laughs> so, for our listeners, Mike told me, I think, 24 hours ago that I would be on this podcast. I said, why me? You know how easily I fly off the handles and get so heated. But you know what? I have, this was a crash course for me. So I have done a lot of research about the USCCB's initiative, Civilize It, um, and also just other pretty basic things when it comes to political discourse. And one thing that stood out to me the most was if you're speaking with somebody or you're arguing with them, ask yourself, why? Mm -hmm. (laughs) What am I trying to accomplish here? Um, Am I angry? Am I passionate about something? Am I trying to, you know, prove a point? Am I trying to change this person's mind? Is this a good idea to carry on this conversation? You know, it's having that, what's the end goal in the back of your head? And A lot of the times, I'll admit, when I get into it with people, I just want to prove that I'm right. You know, I'm I can't say that I'm actually trying to change their mind or make them more enlightened. I just get so heated, and I want that to be heard. And And that's not a good way of doing things. It isn't, but I mean, we do need to respect the fact that it is, in fact, human nature, and we are very much humans who are capable of of reverting to our base instincts, which are, you know, some, something that I believe in has been threatened and I'm gonna lash out at it uh, in a fight. And it's not that my belief is wrong, but we may not be finding the best way to articulate it. There's a there's a podcast I like to listen to um, called 538. It's part of a website. I've heard of that, yeah. They, um, they, they are data oriented. Uh, they don't get into a lot. They're not really like punditry. They're not punditry at all. They get into polling and understanding why people 
make the decisions they make. They create a model to predict, you know, what will happen in mm-hmm. elections and stuff like that. So it's all very scientific based. One of the co-hosts, so one of the hosts of their podcast, their their 538 Elections podcast, is a guy by the name of Galen Druk. And I was listening to this podcast, I don't know, about, I want to say six months ago. And he said uh, his father has a quote. Um, oh, actually, it goes all the way back to January. I wrote it down. Wow. Galen, his, fo- his father, Galen Druk's dad, has this quote. It says, measure response by how it serves your goal, not by how it serves your fury. I Love have, it. Yeah, isn't Love that great? It. That's a great That's line. That's the perfect way of saying it. And right. Because... If I'm having a conversation with someone, I really want to help them come to maybe a different conclusion. Yelling at them is never going to be the way to do it. Telling them they're an idiot is never going to be the way to do it. It doesn't matter that they are, in fact, an idiot. Telling them that they're an idiot is not going to be helpful. The ad hominem is just, that's probably the worst thing you can do. It really is. Name calling, mudslinging. It's, you're not going to win an argument, which is why this civilize it program initiative um, is such a such a great way of doing it right Matt can you give us some other sort of perspectives that civilize it endorses yeah I think it's an option for dialogue and listening um, crazy it is as Catholics an option for prayer and bringing um, some mm-hmm. discernment and some reflection you know I think of um, you know the idiot calling you know why do we do it sometimes sometimes it feels good to call someone <laughs> that we disagree with an idiot but does it serve the goal? In some ways, it could be selfish. It may feel good for me, but if exactly. it's if it's about advocating for something we believe in, if we really want that thing to change, it's not it's not effective in doing that. So yeah. it mm-hmm. might feel good to call someone an idiot sometimes, but it doesn't serve the goal. So right. you know, unity of the body of Christ. You know, it's I just read a quote from Pope Francis, which is it's not about our opinions or beliefs what unifies us. It's the Holy Spirit that unifies us. So. We have to stop thinking we're only in community or friendships with people who agree with everything we agree with. We've got to make space for for differences, which often we can learn from. You know, yeah. everything has got great nuance in it. You know, if we listen to each other, we can learn new perspectives and hopefully have a, a mutual conversion of each other. And right. it doesn't. And, oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, and to that point, Matt, about just looking at some of the language for this for the civilize it. My first reaction, and I think I said this to you, Mike, was, yeah, 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 be civil, be polite, but what about the people who shouldn't have a platform because they are that hateful, right. you know? And so I'm thinking, so what is what is this really going to be about? Is it no more than be polite and respectful, turn the other cheek? It's more than that. And it answered my question about, you know, what happens when somebody does become you know really hateful or whatever it may be but in the in the civilized language i keep seeing the word dignity and i think that's so important um where one we have to recognize human dignity in the people that we are arguing with Mm -hmm. you know recognize them as people they don't need to have our respect they don't need to have agree with our opinions they have dignity though and um i like how they also included as part of the the pledge everybody can find this on the usccb website but um there's a line in there i will stand up for my convictions and speak out when i witness language language that disparages others dignity yeah and that was such an important line you know of course i well it doesn't come so naturally but recognize the dignity in others but that does leave room for advocacy, mm-hmm. you know, when others' dignity is threatened. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, um, the there are such examples in our history of politicians, but also human beings, who have been able to to advocate, advocate for their perspectives um, in a way that was wholesome, joyful, loving, without giving up what their core beliefs were. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this isn't this isn't a conversation that you know you should you should give up your beliefs or right. that you should necessarily even back down from them or or give an inch in any way shape or form it's a it's a conversation in making sure that you, that we particularly as catholics um you know that we we not that we join the fray 
the political fray, but we do it in a way that showcases the goodness, the joy, the Christianity of our faith, um, and not in a way that makes us look like we're pushovers or you know mm-hmm. the, the word of the day snowflake we're not we're not snowflakes about this kind of stuff that we intensely believe it but we know that we don't need to call someone using profanity we don't need to denigrate their person their family their background their style their the manner in which they dress their gender their the color of their skin any of these things that that are such easy targets for people Unfortunately, you know, people will, will gravitate to that when either they've reached the end of their argument, like they've said this thing 16 different times, and we don't know how else to tell it to you. Right. So at this point, I just have to call you a, a terrible name, because that's why right. we have to end this argument. It's like, no, and it's not easy. To live like this is not easy. Like, no. So, so I, I do public relations for the Diocese of Camden, right? I get a lot of letters. Oh, I get <laughs> letters, emails, phone emails, calls, text messages. You probably get a carrier Facebook pigeon comments, in the <laughs> some from me, <laughs> some from Matt. <laughs> tweets, everything that right. everything under the sun that you can imagine has come at either myself or Bishop Sullivan or someone. Some of the overflow comes to me. Yes, to be fair, it does. Yeah, particularly anything related to Catholic charities. That's Mary, true. Mary certainly yeah. gets, got the joy of that when uh, when Catholic charities was was working at the, uh, particularly at the border over the last right. couple of years and working with the refugees, you'd be surprised at- Very hot topic. How many unchristian comments will come <laughs> from people who otherwise seem to be Christian human beings? Right. Um, and that's hard. It like, is. Oh, you know, I've developed thick skin. I'm sure you both have too. Especially you, Mike, the seasoned PR guy. I don't <laughs> but, have organs anymore. It's now it's just yeah. thick skin. <laughs> but I mean, it's hard and it's, it makes you think like, oh, this is coming from people who are Catholic too. Yeah. You know, this is just, it's sad. There are days, right, when you get angry, there are days when it's just really, really sad. But what gets me through that, you know, and I always call back, I want to hear what they have to say. I take note of what they say. Some people just want to be heard. They, yeah. And you are giving them dignity by giving them a voice. And, um, it's also helpful to remember that sometimes the people who speak out the most have the most vitriol um, in their, you know, in their tones and language. They're the minority, right. I think. <laughs> the people who kind of make the most noise, oftentimes, that's not representative of all Catholics. And I try mm-hmm. to keep that in mind. You yeah. know, it's same thing with writing reviews at restaurants. And you know, <laughs> you write a bad review, right? How often do you write like a a good review That's so true. you get more more bad than good if that makes sense yeah see, seeing the bigger picture is important and you know something that i've kind of come to grips with is that sometimes and this is kind of running astray of of the civilized it but just as sort of a personal mm-hmm. perspective um I have I have accepted the fact that sometimes people just need to vent right um, not the right thing to do uh from to the venter but Sometimes, you know, what we read on social media or the phone calls I get or the letters or something like that, I, I realize that they literally just needed to get this off of their chest. Yeah. And I, tra- I try to take it with Catholic charity. I'm like, mm. okay. Right. You know, no, A, thank you for letting me know because mm-hmm. I, didn't, you know, I didn't know that you had this feeling. Or perhaps I didn't know that you had this feeling. Nine times out of ten, I know who I know who who's going to send me a letter and what that letter is going to say because I've gotten a lot of them. Yeah, but um, but keep sending them because I understand it's important to you. Um, so and that's something you know on that other side of the civilize it. If you're the person trying to to be the civil one in the discussion, you know, be accepting to, of the fact that sometimes you know people are just so upset and so strung out and in the case of where we are right now so afraid mm-hmm. so tired mm-hmm. so they, there's a level of anxiety out there that i don't remember the last time i remember this level of anxiety was the mid 80s and i i not old enough to go back to the 60s and the and the um mm-hmm. and the cuban missile crisis but but oh, i remember geez, that i can only imagine growing up in the terror of a constant threat of nuclear annihilation mm-hmm. And I remember going to bed at night with that kind of fear. And I, I kind of feel for some people that that's the, that's the constancy of the fear that they're currently living in. And because of that, you know, I recognize the fact that people are just going to lose it on me sometimes right. if I tell them something that they are not going to be happy to hear about. Right. Um, so and I, fear can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. And I think mm-hmm. one of those is anger. Yeah, oh, yeah. 
that's a huge part of where, you know, a lot of this angry language comes from is just fear of the unknown, anxiety, uncertainty. And another pithy thing to remember, we're, we're throwing out a lot of pithy uh, things for you, <laughs> you to... You said that word a lot today, Mike. I, I do. Well, there's a lot of pithiness in my life. <laughs> um, wow. The, His uh, weight and p- pithy. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the word of the day. Pithy. Yeah, right. Um, the other thing to think about is, um, oh man, I just had something brilliant to say and it popped out of my head. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. Mm, and correct. people are really geared up and angry. Nine times out of ten, that's coming from a place of love. Now, maybe misguided love, but it's love nonetheless. There's a love of whatever their community is, whatever their society is. Mm. You know, everything that we've seen, all these demonstrations that we've seen, and I mean demonstrations on both sides. Right. I know it's going to sound like a weird thing to say to, for some people to hear, but you know, they came from a place of love. They came from a place of wanting what they have to stay or wanting what they have to change. Um, and if you walk into something realizing that they have a perspective that needs to be honored and that the best way to handle it is not telling them they're wrong, um, you've, already, you've already succeeded. You're already three steps ahead of where you would be if you just came at them and telling them terrible things. Right. Right, Matt? That's deep. I, I'm thinking a lot about, I think, modern-day examples to me is Pope Francis, who's you know, all about culture of dialogue, you know, listening. You know, I think a lot of the civilized it stuff comes from Pope Francis. He gets some arrows slung at him sometimes, mm-hmm. but I, to me, he's very grace filled in how he responds. Then I think of the civil rights movement. When I was watching this, is like you know, in the civility pledge, it says "rise above tax when directed at me." I, mean, I don't know how people, you know, get that's a tricky one. Hot coffee dumped on you, called names, you know, people punching you, sitting at a at a lunch counter. Mm-hmm. Like the, you know, to me, it was definitely a, it was a Christian movement primarily but definitely a spirit-filled movement for people to respond and not respond in kind. You know, if I have someone yell at me, I want to yell back. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of awed again by the civil rights movement and how they really lived out the civility, I think, through real prayer and real spirituality. Right. And, and that, sometimes, sorry, oh, good, no, good, we good. both start talking at the same That's time That's because we're so both much. brilliant people. It's not <laughs> And we both have the same mistake that, that we make the same mistake that Matt makes what? Which, when his thing is like he was thinking about his next response without listening to what the person was saying. <laughs> I except, was listening to except, Matt. I can tell you exactly what he oh, just said. I was going to say I was listening to Matt. I was just going to talk about. Well, no, I don't remember what I was going to say. So you go first. I talked you out of it. The uh, well, it, the power of prayer. I mean, it really yeah, is an important element of some of these things. Is is taking that moment to breathe, hmm. to say a prayer. Um, I don't do it nearly enough. There are two things I don't know enough. I don't pray enough, and I don't read the lit- the litany of humility enough. Because mm. I definitely don't have enough humility. Um, but it really is true. You take it. You take ten seconds to say a prayer, and then go back to whatever it is, however you're going to respond. You may not be able to do that in the moment, but mm. maybe before you send a angry letter or something like that. Isn't there a prayer that goes with this? There is. I have it right in front of me. Could you pray it, please, for us? Absolutely. And you know what? It reminds me a lot of um, the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Um, Well, I'll just read it. (laughs) Go ahead. Um, The name of it is, Make Me an Instrument of Your Peace, a Prayer for Civility. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where uncivil words prevail, show me how to model love. Help me remember the God-given dignity of all and invite others to do the same. Show me how to build bridges and not walls and see first what unites us rather than how we diverge. Let me seek to understand before asking to be understood. Give me a listening heart filled with empathy and compassion. May I be clear in sharing my own position and respectful and civil in describing those of others. Let me never tolerate hateful ideas. May I, may I invite all to charity and love. Lord, help me to imitate your compassion and mercy. Make me an instrument of your peace. Amen. I love that. that is I love it too. Come to think of it. It's, Saint, it's the St. Francis of Assisi it's prayer, right? It's based off of that one, yeah. I, and that's always been one of my favorite yeah. favorites. Yeah. A good reminder, it, you know. Yeah, I agree. And um, come to think of it, it's also a reminder that we, on this show, we don't pray a lot. I, I, we're a Catholic podcast that doesn't pray a lot. Um, yeah, The Talking Saints right. podcast does, but this one doesn't. And right. it's mostly because I'm usually talking and, you know. <laughs> I, I eat up all the time before we get to get to a prayer time, so I, I probably should start including prayer in it. Now, 
you know, so the Civilize It initiative is sort of one thing that the USCCB does. The other thing that they do, and this is where I go back to, you know, just because we're Catholics and we and we we should, as good Christians, be taking a Christian approach to politics, that doesn't mean we need to alter what our beliefs are and what we what we in the Catholic Church hold as truths that should be informing our voting practices, and because of that, the USCCB puts out something every year, and it's usually updated for each each election. It's called Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. So this is an initial for mm-hmm. uh, initiative for, for faithful citizenship. Um, and fortunately, if you, if you Google it, it'll take you right to the USCCB site. There's PDFs. There's things for parishes to use, dioceses to use, uh, people to use in their own personal life. So if you if you haven't done it, I, I encourage you to go to it. Um, you know, it's part of the, you know, you can get to the Civilize It uh uh, initiative from there as well, mm-hmm. but um, you know the, there's a main PDF. It's like 53 pages long, and wow. it's all. So I, you know, obviously I can't go into detail with it now, but it's really things that that as Catholics we really need to discern, think about, and determine once we get into the voting booth, or if the case may be, mailing in our ballot. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, that's it's the first time I've ever had to say that. Is right, that right. I've never, I've, only, I've voted in every every single election in my entire adult life. I've never missed one. You so like I've getting fi- the little sticker, Mike? <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> not to distract from going on my little faithful citizenship sorry, thing, sorry. but I've only gotten the sticker once. because I go, too, actually. Well, then again, there's only been... Well, I, well you're much younger than hands, me. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I go so late in the day that because I usually do it after dinner, I, I, they're always out of stickers. But um, I but hope I you get one this Thank year. Thank you. Or, well, who knows? I might be mailing it. We don't know. Oh Maybe yeah, that's send right. You a sticker. That's right. Um, but the uh, I always bring mine since my son has been born. He's now twelve. He's accompanied me to three presidential. Well, he by. The, the end of this year, or by the election, he'll come to three with me. Uh, but he's come to every election, and I um, he always comes into the booth with me. We have a discussion mm-hmm. on who the options are. I ask him his opinion. He tells me his opinion. Sometimes it's just based because he likes the name. So oftentimes <laughs> I ignore his opinion. But we have a good we have a good opportunity. The the, the That's ballot a workers. Good, you know, it is. And, yeah. He was he's been watching the DNC election, mm-hmm. or not all of it, but parts of the convention with me. He's going to watch part of the RNC convention with me next week because I'm such a junkie um, <laughs> it's uh, but it's been great he does not listen to any of my po- political podcasts though so which yeah. is probably for the best because some of them do have very strong language uh, right. in them not that, that will not be found in ours because we are civilized <laughs> and we are not talking about punditry right the, right uh, you know Matt you're actually working on a project in the diocese which we're not really ready to uh, promote yet but it is going to be happening most likely sometime in September October time you want to give an idea of uh, a faithful citizenship and b this this program we're going to run roll out the building intercultural competence for ministers? Nope. That's Uh-oh. the one where it's going to come out in a couple of months. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The one we just got off a Zoom call about. Civilized so many projects. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to read your mind. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, well, the webinar. So we're, we're looking yeah. to put together a webinar. Yeah, we're going to have a webinar with, uh, in conjunction with St. Maximilian Kolbe, really combining civilize it with faithful citizenship, which makes sense. Faithful citizenship is you know, forming our consciences for voting. And civilize it is when discussing our, our political views or our views about morality, doing it in a way that still ups hold our, our you know the dignity of all people. Um, faithful citizenship. I like in the in the in the little uh, after the colon. It's like forming consciences. So that means sometimes our consciences are already formed. So this means it should be an ongoing process. You know, we should never stop learning. Uh, and reflecting and praying, and we should always be open to new things. I love my grandpa, he died at 98, and my grandpa oh my didn't have a new thought from probably 80 to 98, <laughs> so he was, he was formed. So to me, I think we should always be in the process of being formed and learning, be open to the inputs of others. So forming consciences means we're in that process of still learning and, and right. being formed. So it's really an invitation to not be hardened in what we think, but to be open to, to conversion. And I have to say, I think, Bishop Sullivan does a great job of that. I know Kevin Hickey, mm-hmm. the my other boss at, at Catholic Charities, the executive director. That's the people I admire most are the people who, like you said, are not set in their ways. You know, 
they have that ability to re-examine things as you know as things change Mm -hmm. (laughs) and with each and every issue that comes about they take the time to like i said earlier just sift through that gray area you know think well what are what's how does catholic social teaching incorporate itself into all of this Mm -hmm. and i mean that that that's a lot it's so easy to stay in our ways and you know that doesn't mean that the goal of civilize it like you said is to you know change how we feel it i don't even know if it's changing how other people feel (laughs) it's just being civil and that might be sometimes just walking away yeah putting an end to it knowing when to stop sometimes that's the most civil thing you can do yeah it's a lot of you know i've you know, going back to pithy comments you know uh <laughs> you know you don't try to you don't want to win the battle but lose the war mm. and you know in the catholic church we're in a war for souls right mm. so that's in our case when and this is you know it's up to you to discern so i'm, I'm not telling any of our listeners what to do nor would i uh, certainly, I wouldn't do it on the podcast. Ask me a direct question after the <laughs> podcast; I might give you some opinions. But um, the you know you have to dis- discern for yourself. You know you were, you brought up Kevin Hickey's name, yes. um, and Kevin we actually invited onto the podcast because but he he had a had a conflict and he couldn't make it. Um, he is probably the greatest human I've ever met who can talk to people with opinions polar opposite to mm-hmm. his but talk to them in a way that is mm-hmm. loving spiritual uh, he I've never met a person who can pull everything back to a, a spiritual quote and this is not a clergy member you know he's not a deacon he's not a priest mm-hmm. right he's, he's, he's a social worker right. who has really embraced his Catholic faith and figured out a way to in his daily life bring these saintly well if he's referring to a saintly person i i can't believe how many saints he knows to tell you the truth oh, this is a guy unreal. who works hard all the time i don't know how yep. his brain hmm. retains all this in addition to every movie made in the 1950s and every book ever written every ever. book ever written it's it's, it's insane it's true. I, he's a genius he um, is somebody, oh i hope he hears this <laughs> I, well he better and you know what else he does he he's always mindful i can't tell you how many times I mean, I've gone into his office and I have ranted and raved just like I have with you, Mike. But he always has a way of, um, he'll find, whether it's an article, a book, something, and he'll just give it to me. Yeah. And sometimes I'm like, that provides a lot of clarity. Sometimes I'm like, great, now I have even more to think about, you know, and more things to consider. But what he really understands is just the enormous complexity of a lot of the issues that we're facing. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that with the trips to the border, you know, he said time and time again, this is not a political issue. When people go down there, um, and this happened during the Share the Journey campaign when members of our diocese went down to McAllen, Texas, it was to learn, (laughs) to learn firsthand, to see every, quote, side of things. Um, The goal wasn't to to even change minds Mm -hmm. it was to bear witness and you know honestly when i went down there the first time i thought i would come back just having reaffirmed what i already believed it was the opposite i was like this is so complex i have a lot of thinking to do a lot of reflecting to do and he knows that you know that was the purpose and it is that's just one of the many and that's you know that's the beauty of you know (sighs) Living a siloed life is an easy trap mm. to fall it into. It really is. A, I have a lot of family members who deal with their life. I have a lot of friends that are that way. And it's and it's because, you know, it's human nature. You know, we, we sort of, we recognize what we see. We recognize what we touch. We recognize who we talk to. And if if that's a very limited community, then you have a very limited perspective. Right. Um, you broaden that out. I have, I've had the benefit of working across the country and across the world and, and meeting a lot of people from from faiths and perspectives that I have no appreciation of mm-hmm. or association with. Uh, but getting to know them did give me the knowledge I needed to understand, okay, this is what makes that person tick. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I never knew that. And thank God I had a, a conversation with them, or else I never would have known what had happened. Right. You know, going back to politics, the 2016 election, oh. it, 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 
it threw me for a loop because I was one of the – I'm a political junkie, right? Right. It, when I – you know, when the election, election day came around, I, we all were kind of resigned to the fact that it was going to be a Hillary Clinton win. Mm-hmm. And when it ended up being a Donald Trump win, and we were all kind of shocked and everybody in the world was kind of shocked because nobody was expecting it. The polls weren't showing in that direction, though that's not entirely true. If you read the polls properly, you would have seen that there was a standard deviation that was perfectly, uh, that he had, I think at that time, he had a one in four shot. A one in four shot is an outstanding opportunity to win an election. However, I did not read the polls properly. More importantly, at that time in my life, I just happened to be surrounded by mostly progressive people. So Mm -hmm. that was my that was my sound chamber. It didn't even occur to me that there was a, a population in the United States, particularly in middle America, that had a completely different perspective right. uh, on what their status in, in the country was and would would vote Republican where it just seemed like such a cinch that the Democrats were going to win. And that failure on my part to recognize that there were people in the world who thought differently than I did, or not necessarily differently than I did, but differently in in, in the sound chamber that I was listening to, um, forced me to realize I need to start reading other things. Right. I need to start understanding other things. So the first thing I did was find every conservative podcast I could find. Uh, every some neutral, great documentaries out there, too. Great documentaries. Yeah. You know, there are great places where we can learn more. Now, I tell everyone to take everything with a grain of salt. Everything, including this podcast, <laughs> is coming to you with an inherent bias to it. Uh, yeah. And it, once again, it goes back to human nature. So that's why it's important to listen to multiple things. Mm-hmm. Um, and generally, the things that have the least amount of bias you can find, even 538, I listen to that and read their stuff all the time. They really are very data-driven. I'd say they're probably the best journalists in the world because they really do give everybody mm-hmm. a fair shake. Um, they, uh, they, for the most part, they kind of called six, or they accepted the fact that that Donald Trump had a high likelihood of winning the election in 2016. They didn't Hmm. call it for him, but they said that there was a high high probability. Um, You know, find those things that, you know, won't make you throw up. But because some (laughs) things that are out there, like I'll listen to and go, oh, man, I can't believe I got to force myself to listen to this because (laughs) these people are insane. But listening to that insanity is important because it gives me I I now understand I am by no means a progressive. But I now have a much better understanding for why progressives think the way they think in terms of policy. I also now have a much better idea of why very far right-wing people have the perspective that they have and why it was created in them. And it's, it benefits me as someone in the Catholic Church. The Catholic, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. The Uh-oh. Catholic Church is, as I tell everyone, is 50% Fox News watcher and 50% MSNBC watcher. And you can kind of figure out what that means, uh, you know, yeah. liberal and, and conservative. Um, so as a, as a member of the Catholic Church, which, you know, people love us when we're pro-life and oftentimes are not particularly fond of us when we're pro-immigration and vice versa, um, you know, it's difficult to speak globally to a to a community that's just like the United States and kind of split in half. Right. So we have to figure out ways of doing it in a way that respects the per- – even if we're promoting a Catholic perspective that they disagree with, we need to do it in a way that respects the person who's listening to it and hopefully will bring them to understanding why these Catholic truths exist. Um, and it's an uphill climb. You know, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's not an easy thing to do. I'm right. probably one of the better people in, in – one of the – not better, I shouldn't say better. I'm one of the more seasoned people at doing, doing this. And there are still times I'm flummoxed by it. I'm like, how right. am I going to pitch this in a way that mm-hmm. right. isn't going to create some – incredible vitriol yeah and sometimes you can't sometimes you have to put it out there and just realize people are going to hate it right exactly and i you know i was looking up like i said i did my homework when you said i would be on this podcast (laughs) so i went down a rabbit hole and i was looking up all the different types of logical fallacies which are very interesting and i'm thinking oh i am guilty of way too many of these but just knowing like what they are Mm -hmm. is helpful and i also read some more about different kinds of arguments, right? So 
And they kind of lead to tips about how to, quote, argue or speak civilly to somebody. And I read one thing that um, kind of listed three types of, of arguments. One of them is arguments as war. And this is kind of, it's really a not helpful one because it shuts down learning and listening. Um, and the whole thing is kind of based on confrontation and the the result is either you win or you lose. So it's, you know, it's about kind of like war. <laughs> um, there's another one called Arguments of Proofs where it's kind of forcing people to ask questions. And I think that's probably more helpful, you know. Um, and then there's arguments as performances. So this is kind of if you were a politician addressing the masses, you would use arguments like this. And there were a lot more, but um, one of the things I read kind of had tips for, you know, if you do get into an argument with somebody um, that somebody was making a case for, forget about winning, you know, <laughs> um, because more times than not, there is no winner here, right? You're, no one's going to be declared, okay, I'm right, you're right. wrong. How often has that ever happened, right. you know? Um, the focus on understanding, and I know that the civilized it um, makes a clear point to highlight this too. Um, listening is one of the most powerful instruments for getting someone to take you more seriously and for you to take them more seriously. So just understanding, listening, asking more questions. And, um, you know, just be polite, be kind. Yeah. <laughs> be it, silent if you want. It, and like they, like it said in the, um, in the pledge, also stand up when somebody else's dignity is being attacked. Mm -hmm. You know, there are ways to, to do this. And before this podcast, I, or before I read more about this, I'm like, there's no way, you know, yeah, how, right. how can I be civil with somebody who is attacking other people, you know, based on whatever it is, race, gender. I mean, but there, there are ways to do it, yep. you know? And we're going to have links to all of these resources uh, yes. in the show notes. So don't, don't worry that you have to like write down what it is that we were, we're talking about. But, um, but, you know, just going back to something I'd asked about with Matt was about this, this presentation that we're going to put out later. I'm excited it's, for this. It's still, <laughs> you it's guys still, have built it up a lot now. It's still in the planning <laughs> phases, but I figure if I talk it on the podcast, I guarantee it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but right now it's intended to be a webinar. It'll be open to, I, we haven't quite figured out how we're going to communicate it yet, but we think it's going to be open to just about anybody who wants to take part in any good, any person of good Catholic standing who wants to, or actually maybe even non-Catholics might want to take part in it. I don't know. Um, but uh, some of your presenters, uh, I don't think we can say who's going to be on it yet, but do you remember uh, where you were asking them where they're from? Yeah, we've got someone from the USCCB, Justice, Peace, and Human Development Office. They work on faithful citizenship. Then I've got someone from Archdiocese of Cincinnati mm -hmm. who implemented Civilize It as a, as a diocesan project. So those are people we're looking at right now. Yeah. And actually, we should give uh, the Archdiocese of Cincinnati a little plug because you sent me a link to, to their... Uh, faithful citizenship page. You remember what it is off the top of your head? I think it's IvoteCatholic.org or yeah. .com. I'm not sure which. Right. One. It, uh, so I, I read through it, and uh, Matt was saying, "Oh, you know, should we share this?" And I went, "I think we should steal it." Um, <laughs> and di dioceses are very. It. Hey, listen, I'm I'm always happy that when someone steals one of our ideas that, that we have out there, there's it's a the whole best form of flattery. I got news for you. Since we started our podcast, there's a whole way, a lot more diocesan podcasts that are in the state of New Jersey now. Is that I'm, so? I'm taking credit for that. Yeah. The um, <laughs> the uh, actually, I, Mary, I was thinking about this now that there are um, some other podcasts in the region maybe we should have a, a podcast host podcast where we invite the other podcast hosts mm. on and we just talk about what it's like to podcast in the northeast can we make it a debate and put into practice the tips from civilize it well <laughs> i mean whose podcast is better <laughs> we could do that but we know it's ours I mean, <laughs> why, why do we we'll just make ad hominem attacks instead the uh no no i i no, it is ours is better because ours is the least produced. So I know ours is better. The oh. Um, the oh, you know what? If, before I forget about this, I wanted to bring this up too. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot. So we've given you some tips for um, reputable Catholic discernment opportunities. Um, however, this 
being the world that we're in right now, um, there are a lot of people claiming to be Catholic entities that don't have any particular uh, connection to the USCCB or a diocese or anything like that. You know, oftentimes they come as mailers to your house, but they usually have social mm. media outlets as well. I'm going to encourage you, you know, when you get, I'm not saying that what they have in them is necessarily wrong. Um, I certainly haven't seen everything that's been put out there. But if it's not coming to you from a reputable source, something that you can actually go to and see what their beliefs are, what forms their beliefs, if it's coming across to you as a politically charged, you know, mailer, or email or phone call or something like that. I'm going to encourage you to really think about it before you you take it sort of hook line and sinker. Um, you know, there are a lot of people out there that want to take advantage of our Catholic faith, perhaps by only pointing out one or two elements of it. Um, when we, let's face it, we have a very rich Catholic faith and tradition um, that's formed by centuries, millennia, actually of of Catholic thought and teaching and scripture, um, make sure that whatever you're using to discern is really coming from a reputable source. Uh, Mm -hmm. I can tell you that the Diocese of Camden, nor just about any diocese in in this region, sends out mailers to, uh, for, for political involvement. You know, we, you know, our, our priests in the Diocese of Camden and priests across the country are, you know, none of them are supposed to, and they better not be, and if I find out about it, um, you know, preaching from the pulpit, but they certainly make available to their their people, you know, uh, flyers and PDFs and things that come out of Matt's office specifically to help us as Catholics discern mm-hmm. how we're going to vote in an election. Um, so right. I'm just encouraging you to keep an eye on those things that may yeah. show up unrequested. Right. You know, you know you, what you just said about mail you said on the internet too and Mm. that is a whole other discussion i mean elections and political discourse in the age of social media i mean you go on facebook and sometimes it's like it's it's bloody people are just attacking each other you know and so this is everything about the civilize it is helpful to keep in mind um you know in the context of of being online you know when you don't see the person behind the keyboard it's you know it's easier to to attack them it is and if you have a question about this kind of stuff you know matt davis is available uh, to have a conversation with at any time or if you're ever angry at anything just call matt (laughs) by all means don't call mike (laughs) because he gets it enough but but if you legitimately have a question or you want matt to come out to your parish or your school um and maybe have a discussion with you or use him as a resource somewhere um the his office page is can be found on camdendiocese.org um and his contact information information is on there so you're able to reach out to him i believe his email address is matthew.davis at camdendiocese.org i have no idea what his phone number is because who calls people anymore <laughs> kind of things are. but um but uh and you can certainly text him at no he's kidding i'm not gonna give out his cell phone but um, i don't even know if i have it the uh but but i mean you know just as we're kind of closing in the last couple of minutes uh, matt is there anything you really want to hit home one more time before we stop I think uh, piggybacking off off Mary a little bit, and those one thing of those flyers is they're already formed. They're trying to tell you what to think, and in mm-hmm. faithful citizenship, it's about forming your own conscience. So whose conscience are we to form? Our own. It's not our business to tell other people what to think or do. We can invite them like us to to enter a prayerful space of reflection, um, you know, study things like that. But anything that's telling you what to do. That, that's not the idea. We only form our own conscience. You know, yeah. invite and share others what we think, you know, with civility, with passion, but we're, we're only responsible for forming our own consciences. So I think we focused on that instead of forming other people's consciences. It, it would do a great service to the church. Yeah. And if you need a, a, sh- a showcase of that, I, the three people at this table uh, probably don't agree on much. <laughs> and yet uh, we have <laughs> a very good work. <laughs> that is really true. Um, but we actually have a very good working relationship yeah. because of that mutual respect. So I have, I, now I was someone who was not like that for most of my adult life, certainly when I was married youthful age mm. um, well, like I said I am not qualified to be on this podcast you know how I fly off the but handles. I was a, I was a ranter and raver back then mm-hmm. and uh, I would I, it took me a long time to get to this part of civility but yeah. if I hope we have been too preachy with you 
and that our listeners have uh, will get gleaned a few things out of this to uh, that they might help them in the next couple of months. And check out Civilize It on the USCCB webpage. They have everything from you know gospel teachings to advice. I mean, it's really worth checking out. It really is. So everybody, thank you for listening. Matt, thanks for joining us. Uh, Mary, thanks for co-hosting. Thank you. And thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.